Oh, there we go. What does it say now? We're ready. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Yana Ludwig. I'm running for United States Senate here in Wyoming. This is my usual Thursday Facebook Live, but for the next few weeks at least, we're going to mix it up a little bit. I'm doing something a little bit different, and um, we're going to have a guest with us. And this week, my first guest is Carl Beach, who is running for Wyoming's U.S. House seat. And I um, want to welcome Carl here. And I got excited when um, Carl declared for a number of reasons. Um, one of those is that um, I mean, first of all, he's from Ryan Park, Wyoming, so he's joining us today from home. Um, and he has this really sweet uh, balance between the kind of like states' rights and local focus stuff and wanting really solid support and accountability from the federal level. And um, I resonate a lot with riding that balance point. Um, and we also have a similar cluster of key issues, although we're definitely not identical in how we talk about stuff or exactly what we're holding with it. Um, we're both really strong on workers' rights and ecological concerns and justice issues. And so it's great to have somebody else in one of these federal races from Wyoming who has a similar orientation to mine. And um, so welcome, Carl. And I'm just going to turn it over to you for however long. All right. So you broke up a little bit there. I'm, I'm... You want to welcome. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, good. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me and, and inviting me to this collaboration. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's just a pleasure to have this time and, and this audience. And, um, you know, we're not competing against each other, obviously. And I, but I think regardless of that, you know, finding common ground among all the different candidates is, is important. And, you know, that we can draw a focus and uh, to issues that that are meaningful for Wyoming. Um, and, and just having that collaboration is always gonna be good. It's gonna be good for Wyoming and good for the United States. So I'm really happy to be here. And so thank you again, it's, it's great. So, mm -hmm. and, you, and you're right, um, you know, you and I uh, in looking at our platforms, we definitely have, you know, common ground that we can draw from and build upon. So, um, you know, if you go to my website, you know, you'll see I kind of identified eight areas that I see as being really important at this time, but, you know, for the sake of, uh, you know, people's uh, attention span and and other things, it's it's good to focus on a couple, you know, three that I think are really important right now. And that is, for me, it's healthcare, um, economic stability and workers' rights, as you mentioned. And then I think the third one that's really important is conservation, public lands and the environment. Um, all of these I see as really pressing issues and things that are things that, you know, that we have to focus on, as you said, at a local level, a state level, and then of course a national level. And then finally, when we're talking about environment, a international level, um, you know, there's no way to deny the interplay between all those different levels. So those are the three things that I, I tend to focus on right now. But of course, you know, a lot of those are also intertwined and interdependent on each other. So, yeah, so those are kind of the three main ones that I look at. Great. So um, do you want to say a little bit about what you're um, what you're particularly interested in in terms of like like what's your health care plan um, when you think about conservation? I know public lands is a big piece of that for you. Um, so just go ahead and say a little bit more about each of those three areas. And then we can talk about them a little bit. Cool. Yeah. So like you, I actually am a proponent of a single pair system. Um, just watching your last week's uh, uh, um, podcast or sorry, uh, Facebook Live on healthcare, you know, I, I definitely align a lot of ways with you on that. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. But I think you identified a, a key issue, and that is that, you know, the, the poorest and the sometimes the, the people with the most health issues may be forced to go into the public sphere if we have a two tiered system, uh, therefore underfunding it in some ways. And that would be problematic. I would also like to extend on that. And the reason I'm a proponent of a single pair system is multiple. Um, but one of those reasons is because I don't think we have a long history of a lot of uh, faith in some of our public systems. You know, if you look at other countries, they do have that long history of faith in their public systems. And so when you go to some of these countries, even if they do have a two tiered system, no one necessarily says, oh, the public system's worse. They just think of it as an option, right? But I fear that in the US, we would have that kind of unfortunate 
thought process that the somehow the free market is better right and so in good times people would migrate to the free market system and then of course in bad times like we're seeing now they would all then jump back to the public system and leaving again underfunded and not viable but the second reason I'm really for a single payer healthcare system is because I think it will really benefit rural areas like Wyoming, um, providing right. more equitable service, right? Mm -hmm. So I think your guest talked about the national health system in, in England. And, you know, I liked his, his, uh, his example that he's like, oh, I can go to Liverpool and on vacation, and I'm going to get the same service. And I think that's what we're going to really see here mm -hmm. in Wyoming, for example, that it's going to be much more equitable across the state. And you're going to get the same service that you're going to see in, I don't know, Matitsi, than you're going to see like in Denver, right? And or Billings or something like that. And I think that's where I, I see a single payer health system really paying off for people in Wyoming. Um, and something that I think would be really beneficial. Because right now we're seeing, again, a system where um, rural hospitals really depend on elective procedures um, to fund themselves or to keep themselves in the black. and that is, you know, I think that affects the way in which the system works and incentivizes things that are not necessary for a lot of people around around the state. Right. Yeah. It's um like in some ways I feel like that concept of like in network and out of network is one of the most disastrous things that has happened with our healthcare system because it really is true that like, you know, if I break my arm in Jackson, like I might not be able to find like an in-network option for that or if i get sick or you know something like that and you know and so the fact that it's so spotty from place to place and that like healthcare is really different in different places i have some friends who have um you know chronic and ongoing issues and like they're driving five six hours to get to like the specialist that is okay for their insurance and it's right. like this kind of crazy like they drove past three people who could give have given them the same service on their way but because this one person like jumped through some hoops with the big insurance company they're able to go to that person so yeah it's incredibly messy right now Definitely. yeah yeah great yeah and that's interesting i hadn't really thought of that sort of yo-yo effect that you're talking about with like you know during good times people might gravitate for toward the private insurance and um so like i feel like that's an interesting piece that I haven't really thought through the implications of. So great. This is why we should be talking to each other. <laughs> right. Well, that's right. Everyone has, yeah. you know, again, different viewpoints, you know, from where you're coming from and, and how you see things, you know, being applied in different areas. I mean, we can't, you know, a lot of times we make that mistake. We're like, oh, let's apply, you know, a system from, I don't know, Germany or, the, you know, the Netherlands mm -hmm. or wherever to here. And that may or may not work, but I think we can take the viewpoints and, and some of the, the ways in which they do apply, you know, like a healthcare system um, and utilize them as models to, to do something here in the US that can be really great. I mean, you know, we often look at our military, for example, as the best in the world, you know, a public funded, you know, aspect to our government that we consider one of the best in the world. I would like to shift that as well into, you know, our healthcare system. And we have a chance to make the best healthcare system in the world that is good for everybody. And that, to me, that kind of shifting of our, our perspective would be so beneficial for people around the U.S. And and so that's something I would hope for, right? Utilizing the models that we have across the world, but developing a system for ourselves that that we can truly be proud of, and uh, and make sure that, that that everyone in the U.S. has healthcare coverage for their own stability and security. Yeah, yeah, and I think about it in terms like I feel like our medical personnel in the united states are like pretty well trained like i feel like we have one of the best systems in terms of like who who we have doing that work and like the quality of work that they're doing and the system around them is horrible and like doesn't at all support that expertise and we've seen like there's been some interesting interviews with people in medical school right now who are basically saying like I don't want to practice within our current system. Like I'm thinking about like leaving the US after med school to like mm -hmm. go somewhere else where like the insurance system around it and the payment system actually really supports the quality of education that I'm getting right, right now is outstanding. And like, I'm not sure this is the place to practice. And I'm like, that feels really sad to me. And it feels like we're sort of falling down on the job in some significant ways. And it's not about the quality of 
our medical personnel at all. It's about like what's around that and the context that they're having to operate in. Right. Yeah, that's like another example of like almost like a brain drain, right? That you you get mm -hmm. people who, who are dedicated to a specific industry or field and then they leave because they don't work well within that environment, right? Which which I think we see that. So we were talking, you know, another aspect to our platforms is about, you know, economic stability uh, and workers' rights, right? And and this is another area that I think Wyoming suffers from. Um, many people leave the state who grew up here um, because the opportunities are just not there, right? They're just not developed enough or there's other factors involved. And yeah, so I mean, I, I think we see that, that consistently happening to a lot of our population. So young people feel you know, opportunities aren't available to them that could be. So whether that's, you know, ensuring that we have better internet access across the state in terms of rural communities, I think that's an important aspect that we need to do um, to increase the uh, attractiveness to Wyoming, right? I mean, I think we're a great state for that. We have abundant outdoor activities, a great mm -hmm. lifestyle, lots of, I mean, maybe not in March, some people, you know, March, April, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but overall, we have some really great, you know, aspects of the state that we can capitalize on, but we have to have that infrastructure to keep people here. And included in that, as I think you and I both agree on is, you know, ensuring that there's a base level of security for workers of all levels mm -hmm. where they can, you know, live uh, good, comfortable lives and feel good about uh, their situation, wherever they may be, Laramie. Uh, Rock Springs, you know, doesn't matter at Sheridan, you know, that they can pay the rent, that they have, they believe, that they have security in, in their health insurance, which again, workers' rights to me and health insurance go hand in hand, right? They go right together. You know, you can't feel secure if you feel like you can't go to the emergency room because of, uh, of right. uh, overreaching bills and the possibility that, that might bankrupt you. You can't do it. You'll never feel secure. And, um, right. And I know what that feels like. I was at that point in my life once. And it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling, you know? I mean, I was yeah. lucky. I was young and healthy, but um, yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think the, the state is pretty close, although the state's also looking at laying off a bunch of people right now. Uh, and so, and Walmart absolutely provides no security for people. I mean, the wages are bad enough that like as... U.S. taxpayers, we spend about a million dollars per year per store on social services to Walmart employees. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, Walmart's just like basically bankrupting our communities. And they've put a lot of small businesses out of business in the process of like coming in and sort of taking over the local market. And, mm -hmm. and of course, we also have fossil fuel industries that are, you know, starting to be on sort of the descendant at this point. And um, you know, and I don't know how you think about this, but the way that I've been talking about um, coal in Wyoming is basically that I, like, I see coal, I think the most productive way to see it at this point is that coal's in hospice, that, you know, we have this, like, beloved member of our community who has, you know, like, my kids have terrific public schools because of fossil fuels, and I'm yeah. super aware of that, and I think we can't diminish the value of what fossil fuels have brought to the state and it's dying and like being in denial about that isn't actually going to help anybody and i feel like you know the best thing we can be doing right now is to be really taking care of coal workers and not letting these sort of like serial vulture capitalists come in and like take over coal companies and then screw the workers over every couple of years as they're going into repeated bankruptcies like that feels like the worst possible thing that we could be doing in terms of taking care of our workers. And when someone's in hospice, you're also making plans for what's next. Like you're not going like, oh, they're gonna be here forever. It's like, well, they're not gonna be here forever. And so what do we actually need to be doing? And so that's kind of how I've been framing it. And I don't know how you think about like that intersection between like workers' rights and coal and oil and climate disruption, which is another thing that you and I both have you know, some attention on. So I would love to hear from you about that intersection. Yeah, well, I think that's a great analogy. I, I do. I think that's a really great way to look at it. Um, you know, and again, I think that's that's the problem is there's a bit of a denial there. And, you know, there's a mm -hmm. bit of, you know, reluctance to move forward because of that, you know, kind of culture and history that's a part of our state. And, you know, I, I get it. You know, my dad was a coal miner and, mm -hmm. you know, I understand 
you know, kind of how that happens. And I understand how it affects a community as well. You know, I've, in my 45 years, I think I've lived through three boom and bust cycles here, mm -hmm. right? I see that and I've seen the effects of it. Um, in my mind, I mean, I think we have to recognize the reality of the situation. And that's, again, it, it works on both levels. The first level is the economic one. And then, as you said, the, the climate and the uh, ecological one, right? There's kind of on two levels. On the economic side, we have to recognize that regardless of whether or not coal or oil or gas or anything uh, continues to you know motor along, <laughs> no pun intended, um, like you know for a certain amount of time, that we're going to see that reduction in workforce is going to happen. That's just because of technology and AI. Automation technology continues to increase, and we've seen that trend since the early 19th century that you know, technology reduces the workforce while increasing production. Well, now we're also seeing a reduction in the market. Mm -hmm. So those two factors are going to reduce the, the workforce no matter what we do. Um, and so that's, that's the e economic aspect and we're gonna have to deal with that in some way. So that means transitioning people to different skills, different skill sets that are more in line with the modern economy and the jobs of the future. Um, and, you know, those are things that can't be replaced by AI, uh, emotional intelligence, empathy, creativity, right? These are the skills that our education system needs to develop, as well as, you know, transitioning people to deal with those uh, uh, different skills uh, on a technological format. Um, on the, you know, environmental aspect, um, the second component of that is that even if you don't believe in climate change, the rest of the world does. And, um, you know, so we are the only ones that withdrew really from the Paris Accord, right? So we are, we're kind of the lone, you know, shark out there right now that's, you know, kind of swimming alone there. The rest of the world is moving forward with these targets of reducing carbon emissions, reducing our impact on the environment. And that market is going to continue to proliferate. Green energy, green markets are going to start opening up. And we can either, you know, take our ball and go home, or we can decide to get in that game. And I see that as a part of what we can do here in Wyoming. Um, you know, fossil fuels will always be in the mix because we utilize them in different ways to create new technologies. We understand that. But the demand is not gonna be anywhere near what it was and we have to recognize that. So um, to me, that's that's where we really need to move forward on is, is trying to, to make sure that we understand that new technologies, new markets are going to open up and we got to be on the forefront of identifying them and capitalizing on them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And that makes a ton of sense to me. And, you know, particularly around like solar and wind are the ones that get talked about the most frequently. And there's a reason for that. Like we actually have abundant sun and abundant wind in Wyoming. And that's not true everywhere. Like we're pretty right. well positioned to be able to be making use of it. And I've been thinking about it more as like, so we have these abundant resources under the ground that we've been really focused on. And we also have abundant resources above the ground. And right. like now we can like start tapping into those in a much more um, like deliberate way. Like it's not that there aren't like windmills all over the state at this point that you can see. And, you know, we've got a lot more potential to be doing a lot more of that. And, and I'm actually in favor of uh, local communities creating microgrids for their communities. Right. Um, you know, one of the bizarre things uh, last summer when I could still drive around the state and like meet with people was driving sometimes for like hours and like there's no people, but there's the electrical wires the right. entire time. And it's like, so this is actually incredibly wasteful, like electricity running along those wires, like some of it just gets lost. There's this thing called line loss. And, um, and so it's not only the resources going into creating that infrastructure, but also, you know, it's just a really inefficient way to be delivering electricity. And so I would love to see like locally controlled microgrids and like really restore some of that power and control and that, um, and that income to our local communities so that they're, you know, being able to like, provide their own electricity locally for themselves. And so that's something I've gotten excited about as I've wandered about the state. Um, and I think we're, yeah, I agree with you. I think we have a, a great potential to realize that, you know, more so than maybe in other places. And you're right. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the obstacles early on in wind energy for Wyoming was the fact that we were so isolated and unable to transfer that energy anywhere. Right. So that was a, that has now started to be, you know, be overcome. 
but yeah. but that was part of the issue. And I think you're right. The way again, like I said, technology is increasing at such an exponential rate that you know it's hard for us you know to plan five years from now really what's going to you know happen in that regard. Um, but I do foresee you know that we're going to have much more uh, much better energy capture solutions and storage solutions that will allow for those like mm -hmm. to be developed easier, cheaper, and more efficiently. So I, I think that's a, a great uh, potential way to move forward here in Wyoming as well. Cool, cool, cool. So one of the things I find fascinating about you and I is that we have so much in common in terms of how we think about stuff. And you're from here. I mean, you're a lifelong, I mean, you, you left for education for a little while, but you're pretty much a lifer in Wyoming. And um, and I've been here for about four years. And so and that's really different. And we often get the like, um, you know, there's this attitude about people who weren't born here. And um, and so I'm in the roughly 50% of the people living in the state right now who aren't from here. And you're in the roughly 50% of the state of people who have been here all along. And, um, and I find it really interesting, like, um, I mean, A, that we can get to such similar places coming from really different backgrounds, but also like, I think there is something really compelling and important about having some people representing us who have been here lifelong. And that's one of the things, you know, Mike Enzi, who I'm running to replace was one of those people. Barrasso and Cheney aren't people who have like lived in Wyoming their whole lives and, you know, are representing us. And, and I think that having that like deep rootedness of like lifelong experience is really terrific. And I also think that like having some of us who have lived in lots of different places, like I've experienced state governments in like seven different states at this point and like have some sense of like what's different and also in bringing in like ideas from other places and whatnot. And, and I just find it really interesting. Like I would love to have us think about like, I think diversity in length of time that people have lived in Wyoming could actually be considered an asset if we weren't so busy, like protect like people like me being defensive about it and like <laughs> in the state the whole time being like, oh, but you're not from here. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know what thoughts you have about, about that kind of stuff and what the experience that you, those years that you spent not in Wyoming, like how you feel like that's kind of flavored your perspective. And then you're somebody who came back and that's not always true. Like a lot of our young people leave and they don't come back, but right. you did. I yeah. did. Well, yeah, I mean, again, my, my, my family has, for the most part, retain, you know, uh, their like you said, their roots here and continue to live here consistently. Um, although my parents had to move away to Nebraska for a while, again, just because of the job fluctuations in the market, right? I mean, that's just right. part, that's part of you know being in such a, a a rural community. Sometimes things fluctuate, and they really affect you know a, a quite a significant portion of that population. So. But my parents, you know, always wanted to stay here. When they came to Wyoming in the 1970s, you know, to them, they thought it was the most beautiful place they'd ever, you know, seen and, and just were so uh, captured by it. So, you know, they've really focused on staying here. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's no doubt that where you're from informs who you are. I mean, that's part of it, right? I mean, you know, I, 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 in my video and I always, you know, when I was teaching abroad and in and, and different places, I always joked about, you know, you know, going a hundred kilometers to the, you know, movie theater, that, you know, <laughs> your sense of, of, uh, you know, that, you know, for some people in Europe, driving a hundred kilometers to do anything is, is quite significant. Right. And, yeah. and so those, are, those are things that, you know, I do I think do inform, you know, kind of the base of, of mm -hmm. who you are and how you see things from a perspective that is different than maybe someone who grew up in a more, less rural area or not in Wyoming. Yeah. Or, you know, for me, like, you know, when I look at food production, I look at it very differently because um, I remember growing up here and and I hated tomatoes because I had never had a good tomato, you know. The, right. The Not fresh from the garden. Yeah. yeah. And, and I still yeah. with you today, you know, that that, um, you know, getting good produce here is, is sometimes difficult. And, you know, those are things that I think you know, did get me to understand and then appreciate how other places utilize, you know, farm to table or, you know, that that's a newer term that's come about in the last 10 years. But if you go to certain countries, it's always been farm to table. Right. So, um, 
for me, like, yeah, the, the kind of, I guess, interplay between growing up here and then leaving and then seeing all these different, you know, cultures and ways of doing things abroad has really made me reappreciate a lot of the things that I mm -hmm. work with here. Um, and also come back with a, a different critical eye on how to improve things, not to do things the same way, but just to understand that there are new ways to do things and, and think, you know, that, and my dad and I were just having a conversation about, you know, building here in Wyoming that I thought was cool. So I just got back from Poland and, and both in Poland. And then I was also in the Pyrenees of Southern France and, and they, they utilize things like, um, you know, they keep the snow on their roofs and it's not because they get less snow. It's because they use it as an insulating factor. Whereas right. here in Wyoming, we're always trying to get rid of the snow on our roofs, right? Uh -huh. and just, again, like looking at those different aspects to say, oh, okay, like this, why mm -hmm. on this way? And how can we, you know, utilize those examples to maybe, you know, make things work better or, you know, change mm -hmm. things a little bit. So just, you know, little things like that are things that now I really appreciate between the two areas, uh, two parts of the world I've lived in, I guess you could say. Nice, nice. Yeah, I keep thinking, um, I, you know, I have a lot of, so I have friends all over the country and I've worked all over the country and, um, and sometimes they get baffled by things. And I'm like, this is just a, like, grew up rural thing. Like, you know, like, like I noticed, like, I live on a gravel road now and I, I was in town in Laramie for the first um, couple years that I was here. And I'm now back on a gravel road. And I like, I sort of figure that you grew up rural if like, the minute you're in the driver's seat on a gravel road and you see another car, your hand just starts doing this automatically. You like, and you don't even think about it. Like, right. this is like universal rural America kind of, you know, programming is like, you just are doing that sort of like friendly neighbor wave whenever you're in a rural area. And so um, yeah, it's been fun sort of thinking about like, how is Wyoming really unique and how is Wyoming, you know, rural America the same way as all of those other places that I've lived that were, you know, mostly rural places. So it's been really interesting thinking about that. And, you know, running for office, you get a lot of people like concerned about where you're from. And so I've mm. had a lot of time to think about it over the last year. Like, what do I feel like is just rural America? And I know that stuff, you know, yeah. what do I need to be really respectful about that is, you know, really, uniquely Wyoming. And, mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's where, you know, again, growing up here, you know, I, I can't shed that off, you know, that that's part of, right. you know, my identity. And I think, you know, that's, that's a really positive thing in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, you know, when we we're kids, we we're always trying to escape it, but then mm -hmm. you, know, you come back and realize, you know, how great it was to grow up in this area. You know, I mean, for me, yeah. I, you know, million acre playground is so unique you know mm -hmm. to a lot of people in the world you know it's just a, it's a different experience right nice nice okay so um so we're getting close to the half hour mark but i there's one other thing that i really want to celebrate um with you before we wrap up and that is so you um you've been doing a podcast um, the Ryan Park Chronicles, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would invite you to go ahead and put your links in the um, in the chat after oh. we're done with this for your website. Um, you know, Beach for Wyoming, uh, and and one of the podcast episodes that I listened to was this really interesting and thoughtful piece. I thought about. Um, white male privilege and you know and so we're both white people running for office in a state who has as near as i can tell always elected white people to represent them federally and i think we're both pretty tuned into like that's a sensitive thing and it's not like you know white people who are like you know we're running to have more power and we already have a lot of power as white people and um and so i just want to really celebrate for the folks that are partly excited about my candidacy because I am tuned into those kinds of social justice issues and whatnot to really check out, um, you know, that piece that you did on privilege and, um, and just hear the level of thoughtfulness that I feel like you bring um, into those issues and, um, you know, want to give you a chance to like say a little bit about that part and like how you relate to kind of justice issues. Cause I know that's important to a lot of people that are following me. Yeah. Well, thank you. That, that, those were very kind words. Um, and it, you know, it's, it, it, you're right. It's really hard to negotiate that, that world. Right. I mean, it's, it's you know, you don't want to be like a white apologist and just be like, well, I can't help it. You know, that I'm white, you know, right. that kind of thing. 
because I think part of that is recognizing that, you know, there's times for you to step down and step back, right? There's times for, to, you know, you know, uh, open that space up and, you know, invite other people to get involved and, and support them and, and that. And for me, yeah, running was, that was part of the decision-making process for me was like, you know, what do I have to bring, <laughs> you know, besides, you know, my white maleness to this table, right? You know, I mean, what is it, you know? And, and it's something I recognize and, and really try to reflect on consistently. And, but I think, you know, we, we started to see, um, you know, cross even even in in the free market in the economic world where we are starting to see ways in which companies and organizations are really distributing leadership differently flattening things out more and and giving you know that space mm -hmm. for people to really contribute in different ways and so for me you know even if if you know as a as a candidate running you know that's that's the type of leadership that i would like to bring you know if i were to be elected and you know, I think that allows for not just more voices to be brought to the table, but also, as you said, to to see them from different perspectives in a way that can be really, truly progressive and, and you know, sort of, you know, bring about change that is going to really help out uh, underserved communities, uh, people of color, like, you know, things of that nature. So um, so I think, you know, sometimes you, you do have to throw your hat in the ring, you know, even though you may think, oh, geez, like this is not you know, the perfect scenario, but, it, you know, you hope that in doing so you can, you know, help, uh, you know, bring more people to the table and bring those issues to light. So that, that would be kind of where I guess I, I come from in yeah. recognizing that, that I'm running as this white man. Yeah. So you're not going to be doing the kinds of stuff that Liz Cheney has been doing about like the tribes are ruining our Western way of life. Like, Oh my God, did she actually say that? Yeah. She yeah, yeah. The irony of a white woman saying that <laughs> it's like yeah really? yeah well, it's interesting. yeah and you know that that interesting idea of way of life right and I, I agree with like we can identify what that means like we can mm -hmm. see it like we know what it means in a lot of ways right but it's not it's it is still kind of elusive and it means different things to different people right um, you know and and I think currently we're seeing an influx of of fairly wealthy individuals coming to Wyoming and you know playing cowboy uh, on a ranch, and that's very different than the way of life I grew up with, right? That's not the same thing. Um, you know, a lot of ranches around here for me have been bought up, um, consolidated. Um, you know, a lot of family ranches have been taken over. And that's something I think, you know, if we want to protect our way of life, we have to protect those ranchers. We have to help support them in maintaining their independence. And, and so you're right, like, it's funny, like how, how we, yeah, I'm not going to be that. <laughs> you know? well, yeah. Thank you for not being that. <laughs> yeah, and, and recognizing that, you know, our, you know, indigenous populations here in the United States have suffered greatly, um, greatly, 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 and we'll never be able to make up for that, no matter what we do. And, you know, we, we consistently need to be um, thoughtful and engaging with them and, and trying to help them to provide, you know, a, a, a situation that betters them on their terms, not our right. terms, right? You know, and, and yeah. so I think that's really important and that takes a lot of listening, a lot. And that's actually why I don't have currently any uh, part of my platform has a section on indigenous rights at the moment, even though I'd want to put that there because I haven't been a part of that community lately um, for the last 20 years, you know, I still have friends in the Wind River Reservation, but I want to go and talk to them before I make any real, you know, strong statements or, or stances uh, currently. I, I feel I need to reconnect before I do that. Nice. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carl, for being with us. You want to, um, so for folks that aren't going to look at the chat stuff, you want to just say what your social media and other contacts are sure. so folks can find you? Yeah, I, you know, luckily, my, since my name is strange in, you know, combined with Wyoming, it's easy to put beach for Wyoming for everything. Because <laughs> you're just like, you're an oxymoron. But um, uh, Glendo Reservoir, no, just kidding. No. So, um, but uh, uh, beach for Wyoming is pretty much the handle for all of my uh, social media. Uh, and so at beach for Wyoming for everything, whether that's Snapchat or, uh, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, all those, all the different uh social media accounts. And then my website is beachforwyoming.org. Um, 
And that's where you can find also links to all those different sites as well there. And uh, yeah, you can see more about me and my platform at that space. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being with me today, Carl. I appreciate you taking the time and um, check out Beach for Wyoming, everybody. Thank you, right. Yana. I really appreciate it. It's been great. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank